Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our Extranet User Manager webinar on Extranets in Office 365. My name is Peter Carson. I'm the president of Envision IT and Extranet User Manager. I'm going to be speaking for about an hour today. I'm also a SharePoint MVP and partner seller with Microsoft Canada. All my contact information is up on the slide deck there, which we will be posting up on our site as well. And we'll be providing links back to that and the recording from today's session. So if you have colleagues who weren't able to join us today, encourage them to either pull down the deck or um, on demand just view the recordings of the webinar. Also on the line today, we've got Amanda DaCosta, who's in charge of sales at Envision IT. She'll be your prime point of contact for follow-up if you'd like to go further in terms of getting a trial version or understanding more about the Extranet User Manager product. And we have Dinesh Sohan, who's our Director of Operations. He really leads the uh, development team and, uh, and the development of the Extranet User Manager product. So in terms of agenda, what we're going to cover off over the next hour or so, we'll start with a brief introduction to Extranet. So I just want to level set people and make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what an Extranet is. Then we'll get into SharePoint authentication, specific to Office 365. I'll mention at the end, we have a, a follow-on session coming next month on Extranets in SharePoint 2016 on-premises. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Office 365 side of it. We're going to talk about some of the scenarios from Microsoft themselves as well, um, external sharing being a feature that many of you are probably familiar with in Office 365, but also more recently, the business-to-business uh, -business offering through Azure that's currently in preview and what that looks like. And we're actually going to take you through some demos to give you a sense of what that user experience looks like through the, uh, the out-of-the-box Microsoft experience. And then we're going to jump into the Extranet User Manager and talk about how that can complement that and can be used from an Office 365 Extranet point of view. We'll wrap up and do Q&A from there. But by all means, Amanda and Dinesh are going to be monitoring the, the questions. So if you've got questions as you're going through there, by all means, post them. We'll, uh, we'll take a few pauses as we go through to answer them as we go, um, as well as making sure that we address any at the end of the session as well. And I just realized I was pausing my screen. So um, if we can just confirm, I should be on the agenda slide there now. I've been speaking, I guess, to the title page. Apologies about that. Perfect. OK. So let's start just with some introduction and background on Extranets itself. What is an Extranet? So it's a website accessible to users outside of the corporate network. So it's, it's all about allowing organizations to share and collaborate with partners outside the organization, whether that's customers, partners, vendors, what have you, um, in a secure and ideally in an easy to use environment. So there's a number of ways that we typically see that. Um, we often build public facing websites on SharePoint and we can extend a portion of that as a private extranet. So we can provide authentication into that portion of the website. Conversely, you could have your corporate intranet um, and wanted to, to expose a portion of that securely externally as well. I mean, we often see that in scenarios like uh, board of directors or uh, committee members and such that are closely tied to the organization. You want to bring them in as, as part of the intranet. Or it could be a purpose-built standalone extranet. We have some customer examples that we'll take you through later as well to kind of show you those different examples and what that looks like. So in terms of the types of people that we see coming into extranets, um, your extranet may be just one of these, or it may be a combination of um, members. So we do a lot of work with not-for-profit and charitable organizations. So they're members, whether they're donors, volunteers, what have you. Um, customers, vendors, suppliers, obviously a common scenario. Board of directors portals we see a lot of. And we do a lot of work in the government space as well. So citizens, uh, researchers from an education point of view, uh, tenants from a property management perspective, partners from a, uh, a partnering perspective, whether it's um, at the, the government level, not-for-profit or for-profit organizations. You know, it applies across all of those. So when we're talking with organizations, these are some of the questions that we tend to ask as we're, we're starting to flesh out what should the extranet look like. And, and the first, obviously, we've already touched on is who is coming into the extranet. You know, what is our target audience that we're building for? And it may be only one of those initially, but there may be a ver uh, view to, to go further with that. You know, maybe it's government portal that's just bringing in suppliers initially, but ultimately in the long term, they actually want to make it a citizen facing portal as well. I mean, that has a lot of bearing, not just on the type of people that are going to be coming in, but the numbers of them as well. Obviously, a, a vendor portal is going to be a much smaller set of users than a citizen's portal for a, a state or provincial level government. Um, is there some sort of 
uh, member database that we're going to be interfacing in with. You know, we often see a CRM system, whether that's dynamic CRM, uh, Salesforce, what have you, uh, that we want to coordinate that member database with. And we've had a number of implementations where we can live retrieve and update information into the CRM as part of the interaction through the portal. Is everybody that's coming into the portal going to see the same information? You know, some extranets are strictly secure publishing portals where you want to publish out a set of information to people. Um, others are more personal and private, say a, a vendor portal where each vendor sees their particular work and documents and such related to their work with the organization. How do people discover the portal? Is it invitation only? Um, or can people self-register? Can they discover it? Uh, maybe it's part of the public-facing website. You can click a link, go through a registration process. Uh, but then we need to understand, well, how does that process work? Who approves those new registrations? Um, how do they get onboarded, You know, get their credentials, their password? Uh, how do they deal with forgotten passwords? Things like that all becomes part of that equation there as well. And then is it just the, the extranet, in this case, um, Office 365, that they're going to be coming into, or are there other systems as well? You know, we've done some work. We've actually won quite a number of awards this year, or actually last year, I guess now, 2015, uh, for our work with the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society, where they're not only providing an extranet to their 8,000 members into Office 365, but it's also being the gateway in there to desire to learn portal as well. So from an online training point of view, um, we're doing single sign-on not only to Office 365, but to D2L as well. So those are some of the things that we use to qualify and understand, you know, what are we dealing with from an extranet point of view? Uh, what does that scenario really look like? So in terms of technologies that, uh, that we're going to deal with here today, we're going to focus on Office 365, but obviously SharePoint being the primary component of that that we're, we're interested in. I mean, 365 is broader than that. It's got Exchange and Link and such in there, but it's really SharePoint Online that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we do support SharePoint on-premises as well. As I mentioned, we'll be doing another session in February on extranets in SharePoint 2016. Uh, whether that's something that you do on-premise or you host up in Microsoft Azure, that's another scenario we support as well. In fact, our product, the Extranet User Manager, is something that you can deploy on-premise, but if you're looking at Office 365, you're probably well down the cloud road. Uh, we actually support hosting our product on Azure, either in your own Azure subscription or we have a multi-tenant environment uh, that we use Azure to, to host on behalf of our clients as well. So a number of options from that point of view. All right. So I want to take a minute now and do a quick poll. I want to get a sense from the attendees uh, what versions of SharePoint you're currently using. So let me just open the polls up here. I'll give you a minute to, to answer that. You can answer multiple. So if you're using, say, both Office 365 and SharePoint 2013, go ahead and check both of those off. Um, I'm curious how many people are kind of kicking the tires on Office 365, hence the curiosity, or they're already there in the cloud in 365 and want to, to do something better from an external collaboration point of view. So we'll give you a few more uh, seconds just to respond on that. All right, so what I'll do now is I'm just going to close that poll out. And let me share that back just so everybody can see the results from that. Um, so 50-50-50 splits, so obviously that doesn't add up to 100%, showing that you know there's a lot of people that are in a hybrid scenario. They're on Office 365 and probably either SharePoint 2013 or 2010 as a combination through there. A few folks on Foundations and on MOS 2007, WSS 3.0. We do support SharePoint Foundations, both 2010 and 2013. We don't support 2007 or WSS 3.0, so we encourage you to, to upgrade to a more current version of SharePoint if you're looking to build an extranet in that scenario. But interesting to see more than half people already on Office 365. So we're seeing a lot of penetration from that point of view. Um, that's awesome to see. The next poll that we want to do, I'm only going to do two here, is just to get a sense of how you use SharePoint today. So is it something you use from an internal collaboration point of view? Uh, do you publish your intranet on SharePoint, which is a very common scenario. We see a lot of organizations doing that. Do you already have an extranet on SharePoint, um, or do you do your public-facing website on SharePoint?
So again, I'll give you a few more seconds to, to answer that and then we'll close the poll out and share that back. Okay, let me share that. So not surprisingly, almost everybody, 97%, using it from an internal collaboration point of view. That's really where uh, SharePoint has its roots as a document management system. Um, a lot of people, 70%, using it from an internet point of view as well. And again, you know, very common scenario. There's a, a huge penetration of SharePoint from a corporate intranet perspective. About half folks using it already from an extranet point of view. Um, so my, I'm, I'm going to take that as that you're interested in seeing what you can do to improve that experience. For the other half that aren't currently um, hosting an extranet on SharePoint yet, coming here to learn more about what that looks like and a small percentage using it as a public facing website, uh, which is an interesting scenario because you've already exposed SharePoint externally. Uh, it's not a stretch to then extend that and turn that into an extranet as well and provide uh, secure access in to that too. So let me hide that and come back to my deck here. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about um, from an implementation point of view is around the authentication of SharePoint and again specifically to Office 365. So there's three primary options we look at from an Office 365 authentication point of view. The first is, is a very simple cloud identity. What this means is that you've signed up for an Office 365 subscription and you've created an identity in the cloud and it's not connected, there's no integration to your on-premises Active Directory whatsoever. And you can run your entire business that way. You don't need to have an on-premises Active Directory. You can simply go in the browser, create accounts for all of your staff, and invite them into your Office 365 um, from all aspects, from a SharePoint, from an Exchange Online, uh, from a Skype for Business point of view. So that's really the easiest to get going. There's nothing that you need to do. You, you simply get your credit card out, sign up for the subscription, and you're off and running and away you go. Now that's typically just for smaller organizations that may not even have an Active Directory within their organization. If you do have an AD, at a minimum, we, we generally see some sort of synchronization happening. So there's a, an Azure um, membership sync tool that you install on premises. Basically, you put that on one of your servers that has access to your on-premises Active Directory, and it syncs information about your staff from your on-premise AD up into the Windows Azure Active Directory. Uh, the reality is that every user that's going to come into your Office 365, whether they're a staff or an external user, has to have an Azure AD credential. It doesn't have to be in your partner directory, but it has to be somewhere in Azure AD. So all of your staff need to be synced up and have, we call them shadow accounts, up in Azure AD um, for them to be able to come into Office 365. Now, you can do uh, not just a sync of the profile and account information, but also of the password hash. So it doesn't actually put your, your password up in the cloud. People get concerned about that from a security point of view. It actually puts a hash to the password. And what that means is that your staff are able to log into the cloud using the same password as they use on-premises. So it's easy for them as they change their password on-premises, that syncs up into the cloud. They only have to remember one password. It's not single sign-on because you do have to sign on a second second time into the cloud, but it is a single password. And it is secure because even if somebody hacks uh, the cloud in Microsoft, they can get your hash, but they can't reverse that and actually get the password to your on-premises. It only allows you to validate that somebody entered the correct password. You can't reverse uh, decrypt it and determine the actual password from that. And then the third option um, is what's called a federated identity. So here you still have to sync your users up into the cloud, but from an authentication point of view, rather than them authenticating against the Azure AD account, they actually authenticate still against their on-premises account. Typically, we see this using Active Directory Federation Services, which is a standard feature of Windows Server 2012. So you, you would install the ADFS infrastructure on premises, and when somebody hits the cloud, like SharePoint Online, it redirects them back to on-premises, they put their credentials on, in through there, validates it, and it creates what's called a SAML token. It's a security token that gets passed back to Office 365 with some certificates and signing on it to make sure that it's secure that then tells Office 365, this is who just logged in, that allow them to come in. If you configure that properly, you get um, a very nice single sign-on process. So users don't uh, see the bouncing back and forth between the different systems happening. They go to access SharePoint Online for the first time in their browser session. They get redirected on premises. Uh, uh, Windows authentication happens automatically behind the scenes. The token gets created pass back to 365 and they're now logged into 365. So it does give you a nice single sign-on experience through there. 
And it's that same federated identity concept that we leverage with our Extranet User Manager product. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we actually act very much like Active Directory Federation services to Office 65, uh, but in a, an interface that you can manage nicely through the browser, through our Extranet User Manager product. So those are sort of the three options from an authentication point of view. The, the key thing to remember is that every user, internal or external, has to have an identity in the user Active Directory somewhere. And we're going to come back to that point as we go through. So let's talk about external users. This is a webinar about extranets. So how do I bring external users into my Office 365? There's really four main scenarios that I'm going to take you through as part of today's talk. So you could just create full subscription accounts for them. Just treat them the same as you would a staff member. You know, get your credit card out or add them to your subscription, pay the same monthly fee as you would to a staff member, and they get all the same rights um, from that point of view. And you can certainly collaborate with them from that perspective. They would typically be um, cloud identity accounts, so their passwords would be managed in the cloud. Although if you wanted to, you could set them up in your on-premises Active Directory and use ADFS for that as well. Not generally encouraged. We don't like to see um, external users in your on-premises Active Directory. Security folks don't like that. Um, so cloud identity is a, a better way to go from that point of view. We can also do external sharing, which is a feature that uh, Microsoft provides as part of Office 365, where you can actually invite people from outside your organization, and they can use their existing Microsoft account credentials or uh, their own Office 365 subscription credentials to come into your Office 365. And I'll actually walk you through what that looks like. Azure B2B, the business-to-business -business, uh, collaboration feature, is a new uh, feature that really complements and extends the external sharing concept. And, and we'll take you through what that looks like and how you interact with that. And then the last being using our Extranet User Manager product to manage those external users. And it's all about uh, user experience and delegation, making it easy to delegate down to the business or even external to the organization so that they can create those accounts, onboard those users, manage those accounts easily, and have a, a great user experience for those external users coming in. So let's talk a bit more about using full subscription accounts. What are our options in terms of purchasing accounts for people outside of our organization? You can purchase a full Office 365 account. You probably don't want to provision Exchange or Skype for Business for um, your external partners. You really just want to provide access into SharePoint Online for them. So there is a specific uh, Plan 1 and Plan 2 for SharePoint Online. I provided the links in the deck here that will take you into the the specifics of the plans and you can compare the, the two. We find that plan one is, is sufficient for most users. This is as a US user, so these dollars are all full retail um, US dollar pricing in here if you're in a different country or region. Now you can also get what's called a kiosk plan. This is actually intended for um, non-knowledge-based workers within your organization. So if you think about, you know, you've got fleet drivers or warehouse staff or construction staff that really work out in the field and aren't on a computer on a day-to-day -day basis, but still need access to corporate resources for HR and policies and things like that. That's really the intent around the kiosk plans. But you can also use those for external users. So they're a tiny bit cheaper than the SharePoint Online. Not a big difference on the uh, the Enterprise K1, which is $4.90 a month versus $5. Um, it does give an, an email account as well as the SharePoint Online access. You don't need to turn that email on, though. You can only provision the, uh, the SharePoint Online portion of that if you want to. So that's certainly an option is to go through there as well. Now, there is also a SharePoint Online kiosk. It's a hidden option that I've had a lot of difficulty trying to nail down is it actually still available and how is it priced out? I've had different folks at corporate and in Microsoft Canada where we're located uh, tell me either it is available or it's not um, and that we need some special exceptions to get pricing around that. It's really intended for you know, large retail customers that have large workforces, scenarios like that where you've, you've got tens of thousands of staff that just need access into the corporate portal. But again, we see that as a good fit from an extranet point of view as well. And the pricing is quite uh, competitive from what I've seen. I can't quote prices here right now, uh, but you can see the difference between the exchange kiosk versus the full enterprise K1 kiosk. The SharePoint Online one is same or less than the, the exchange one. So that's certainly an attractive option if we can figure out how to, to purchase that one. And if you're interested in that, by all means, reach out to me. The, the more folks I can get help and bang on the door at Microsoft to show interest in that, uh, the easier it is for me to, to push that forward and actually get some uh, pricing and details around that. So those are sort of our options as uh, full subscription accounts. 
Now let's move into Office 365 external sharing. Um, the, the beauty of this one is that you get unlimited free external users. It used to be limited to 10,000 users. Microsoft took the, the wraps off of that about a year or so ago now. And you can invite as many external people as you want into your Office 365 subscription. It doesn't even matter how many paid subscribers you have. I mean, you could be a one-person company um, and invite in 10,000 of your closest friends to collaborate with you in your 365 subscription. That's totally within your rights and the, uh, the license rights as part of the, the online agreement. Now, the caveat is you have to use the Microsoft login form. You can do a little bit of branding that to, uh, to add some of your own look and feel to that, um, but ultimately it's the, the Microsoft form that you're coming through. And those external users have to have either a Microsoft account or be an Office 365 subscriber themselves. So they have to log in through that account as part of that. Now, the real thing that I, I see as a challenge and an issue with this is that as the business owner inviting people in, I can invite them on a particular email address, um, but they can choose whatever account they want as long as it's it's one of the above a Microsoft account or an O365 subscriber to accept that invitation and come in. So I don't have control. I may invite somebody thinking they're coming in from their corporate account and they can choose to use their personal Hotmail account to accept that invitation. I have visibility to that, but from a governance point of view, it becomes pretty messy pretty quickly trying to manage this. So it, it really is a lightweight solution and that's how it's been described by um, by Bill Baer himself, who's kind of the, the father of SharePoint at Redmond and Microsoft. Um, so there are certainly some challenges around that. But let's actually take you through what that looks like. So I've got a couple windows open here. I'm going to flip over to, let me see here, this one here, yes. So this is my Office 365 developer tenant that I've got, um, Envision ITP cars and not SharePoint.com. And let's imagine that I want to invite somebody into this. So right now I'm signed in just with my cloud identity. We don't have federation set up. There's nothing fancy configured from an authentication. So this is really an out of the box Office 365 subscription. In fact, the, the site collection is, is newly recreated last night, plain and simple and nothing in there. So there's a couple of things I need to do first. So first is I need to come over to my admin link here come into the admin portal and down into SharePoint to bring up the, um, the SharePoint admin center. I've clicked on the, the main root site collection here and you'll notice there's a, a button in my toolbar called sharing. So if I go in there, what I need to see, whoops, I've had that sitting there too long. Let me just refresh that page is I need to see that the external sharing is turned on. By default, it's not turned on. Um, so it's it's good from a security point of view that you need to explicitly turn it on. So here I've allowed external users um, to sign in as authenticated users. You, you also have an option to allow anonymous access links. What this means is you can share a link out and anybody who has that URL can access that document. They don't need to authenticate whatsoever. That was a little more dangerous, but there are scenarios where that makes sense as well to be able to provide that. Challenge is once you turn this on, if people have permissions management in the site, you know they're they're free and clear to start inviting people in from outside. So it gets tough from a governance point of view to manage that and to understand where permission inheritance is broken and some of these custom permissions are coming in. So there's not a lot of reporting around um, what that looks like. Some of the third-party vendors like ShareGate have started to add reports to their tools uh, that let you see where external sharing has been enabled and help you to manage that. Let's come into the site itself and say, well, I just want to invite somebody into the site. So I come here to my gear icon, click on shared with, and I can say, okay, I want to invite somebody. And I'm just going to type in one of my test email addresses here. And say, yep, I want to do that. Now it's telling me here, pcarson1 and divisionit365.com is outside of your organization. So it knows that it's an external user. And in this case, this user had never been invited in before. So it's a net new user. I can define whether I want them to be a view editor owner rights. I'm going to leave it as edit rights on there and go ahead and share that. So what this is going to do is it's going to send an email to me from Microsoft saying that somebody has just invited me into this site. So let me come over to my inbox. We'll see how quickly those come through. Just waiting for that to show up. What I want to take you through is the acceptance process on that. You can see how you get to choose what account you want to come in as part of that. I'm going to open a couple of different browser windows um, so that I can do it as a, uh, a private session separate from the one that I'm logged in here. 
And unfortunately, sometimes these emails take a little while to show up. Maybe what we'll do is, is we'll come back to this one in a minute once that's come there, and we'll switch gears into the next scenario that we go through, because I want to be mindful of time as we're going through here. So the next section is, is focused on Azure B2B. So this was something that went into preview back in September. Uh, it's still in preview right now. It's sort of early first days. It's got some rough edges around it, but you can really see the potential for it, and I'll take you through what that looks like. Um, so it's, it's based in Azure. It's not specific to SharePoint Online and our, our Office 365. It's really a general way uh, to, to connect partners into your organization through Azure AD. So SharePoint Online is only one of the ways that you could do that. You could have your own Azure hosted applications, you know, dynamic CRM, other things like that. Um, there's lots of scenarios where you can bring people in from that point of view. And the idea is uh, that those partners that you invite in come through their own partner managed identities. So if you've got partners that are already using Office 365, this is an ideal situation because you're actually allowing them to use their own existing Office 365 credentials to come into your site. The nice thing there is um, as people leave organizations, you know, they get taken out of their own Active Directory and Azure Active Directory, which means they're automatically removed from your extranet as well. So that issue of you know not knowing whether partners that you've invited in are still with those partners and should they still have access to your site, that kind of goes away because that's actually managed on the partner side for you. Uh, but you still decide who from those partners you bring in and what rights they have within that. So it's a nice balance through there. It also makes it very nice if you've done um, much work in SharePoint Online with multiple tenants and subscriptions, you probably run into the challenge where as you flip between sessions, you actually have to start opening different browsers and in private windows and things like that because you can't be signed into SharePoint Online in the same browser with two different identities. You have to keep those separate from each other. So it gets pretty confusing quickly for users if they can't use the same identity. So this is a big bonus from an Azure B2B point of view to be able to do that. Let me just do a quick check back, see if that sh um, email I was looking for showed up. Yeah, here it is here. So we'll take a, a minute to just finish off the external sharing scenario. So this is the email that came from Microsoft saying that Peter Carson has shared this site with me. I'm not gonna click directly on that. I'm gonna copy the hyperlink because I wanna put it into a particular um, browser window through here. So let me come over into this one here, Internet Explorer, and I open it in private. So I have a completely separate session. And I'll go ahead and paste that URL. So this is what I see when I click the link on my email saying, welcome to SharePoint Online. I've got an invitation I need to accept. And I need to decide what account I'm going to accept that with. I can accept it with my organizational accounts. We do have ADFS set up and, and single sign-on with our accounts. Or I can use my Microsoft account. So let's say I just decide I want to use my Microsoft account to do that. I actually have to sign in with that Microsoft account. So it authenticates, it builds that connection now between that Microsoft account and the site that was shared with me, enters me into there, and now I have rights into that envisionitpcarson.sharepoint.com. It's hard to tell the difference because there's lots of Peter Carsons under different accounts here, uh, but that's actually a, a, a separate account. So if I look at my settings for that particular one, uh, we can see here it's a big long um, identity but you can see the peter underscore envisionit.com and then this pound, external pound, identifies this as an external user in this tenant here. So if you understand the nomenclature of how it forms up those, you can kind of see where those are coming from. Um, I was originally invited under that email there, but it's actually a different account that I've accepted under. So you can see there, yes, it allows me in, uh, but me as the owner of that site didn't get to decide how that person came into the site. So that's something that Azure B2B gives us um, on top of that. So let's come back to that scenario now. So I want to go through, um, and, and I'll walk you through in pictorial form first, and then I'll take you through a demo of what this looks like. So the process starts with a CSV file. So you use Excel, you create a CSV of all the partners that you want to invite into your site. Um, so it's not particularly user-friendly yet, and, then, and that's where there's some rough edges still to be ironed out. Basically, import that CSV up into the Azure portal, 
and Azure sends out email invitations similar to the one that we just saw for each of the people in that CSV file. They click on the invitation, it is locked to the account that you were invited into. So you don't get that option to, to choose some different account. You know that how you've invited somebody in is how they need to accept that. Once they accept that through, the connection is then built into Office 365 from there. So let's actually go through that process. What we're going to do is start back on our um, Envision IT P. Carson dev site that I had. So this one here. So the first thing I need to do is come back to my admin portal and go into Azure AD. This is where I'm going to be doing my work. So as a, a person inviting people in, it's actually in the Azure portal that I do that. I'll just wait for that to log in. So what happens when you create a Office 365 subscription is under the hood for every subscription, Microsoft creates a free Azure AD um, subscription as part of that. You don't pay for it, it's totally free. Um, and when th you first come into the, the Azure portal under that account, it actually provisions the management interface for that. So it takes a few minutes the first time in. Once you've done that, you'll see your AD listed in here, which is the one associated with that Office 365 subscription. Now there's a couple of things that I want to do. First, what I want to do is I want to manage groups through here rather than in SharePoint so that when I invite people in, they're already part of a group and they already have permissions assigned in SharePoint. From a governance point of view, that's a nice thing to do. So let's come into groups. We don't have any groups there right now. So I'm going to add a new group. So we're going to call this one B2B SharePoint because we're going to use it in the SharePoint portal. So we'll go ahead and create that group. It doesn't have any people in it yet. But what I can do is I can come back to my SharePoint site here and click on my share icon just like I did before. And I can type in B2B SharePoint. Sometimes it takes a minute. Now that's not going to show up just yet. So again, we're going to have to come back to that one because it hasn't synced between Azure AD and Office 365 just yet. But what we're going to want to do is apply permissions to that group. So let's come back to our Azure AD and dive into that group. Now you'll see in this URL here, there's a couple of GUIs. One is for the Azure AD and the other here is for the group itself. So a GUID is a, a globally unique ID. It's, it's a unique identifier for this group that we can use elsewhere then. We're going to need that ID. So I'm going to copy to my clipboard when we set up our CSV file. So let's have a look at what that file looks like. So I've got the, uh, the CSV open here. I just want to invite myself as one person through here. So I'm going to invite pcarson.admission.it.com, which is my main production federated identity in our, our real Office 365. So I put in the email and the display name that I want for that. Um, where do I want people to go after they accept the, uh, the invitation? So I want them to go to that dev tenant that we're working in. And you can see here there's an invite group resources. What will happen is this person will get put into that group as part of the onboarding process. And I want to just delete that GUID and then paste in the one for the group that we just created there. So that will put them into that group that we just created. So I'll go ahead and save that CSV. Excel always complains about that, but that's fine. And we'll just close out of the CSV. Okay, so if I come back to my Azure Active Directory here into my Envision IT, and I go to Users. When I say Add User, so I can see I've got a Microsoft account that I shared in there. That's the one that we did the, the previous example. What I want to do now is add a partner organization in. So this is a new option that just showed up as part of the preview back in the fall, this Users in Partner Companies. So I click on that, and it gives me an option to, to browse for a CSV file. So let me go ahead and click there. I've got it in my uh, OneDrive for Business, which isn't showing up there. Hang on a second. Try that again. There's my b2v.csv file. And I hit OK. So what it's doing now is uploading that CSV file and processing it. It's only got one person in it. It doesn't take very long to do it. You could do hundreds or thousands of people through there. There's no limit. There's no cost to it, just like the external sharing in Office 365. So I want to open up that batch status report and just see how that worked. 
you can see there's still a preview on that because this is all in preview and it's already delivered the, uh, the email to the email server. So that invitation has now gone out. So again, I'm going to want to see that show up in my inbox and then we'll go through that process there. That one came a little faster. Here it is. So again, I mean, you can customize the look and feel of this email. This is the, the plain out of the box experience. I've been invited to access their application and here's a link to click on to use that application. So I'm going to copy that hyperlink and I'm going to come over here. So this session I've got here is actually our our regular production Office 365 where we do our Envision IT work in. In fact, here I've got the uh, the webinar that we're doing here, you know, the, the report, the PowerPoint, everything that's in here. So I'm already logged in to Office 365. Let me just refresh that to make sure. There we go. And I'm going to open a new tab and click on that link. So again, I get a page saying I'm being invited into an application, invited as pcars at envisionit.com. You can see here it's got my email address, but I can't actually type on that. So I have no choice. I have to use that particular account to accept that invitation. I can either choose not to do it right now or accept it. I'll click on the accept. It goes through. It establishes that connection. I've been invited successfully, and now it's going to redirect me to the application, which is the URL that we put in to take us to that EnvisionIT pcarson.sharepoint.com. Now, it didn't work because we actually forgot to go back and set up that group. So let's do that right now. So if I come back to my other session where I am logged in to the site, let's just refresh this page. I'm going to do the share again. Type in my B2B. So now we see that popping up in our search results because it's synced in from Azure. We'll leave it as can edit again and we'll go ahead and share that. So then if I come back to here where it said I didn't have access, let's just take that part of the URL off, try hitting the site again, and boom, now we're in as an editor. And I'm actually logged in with my corporate ADFS account. Um, again, we're seeing that external tag in there, uh, but this is my corporate account that I'm logged in. And if you're familiar with running multiple sessions, you can see I'm logged in to our envisionit.sharepoint.com, which is our main corporate, as well as this Envision IT P. Carson, which is a totally different subscription, using the same credentials in both of them. So from an Office 365 partner, that's a really nice experience. It's a nice way of going. Challenge is, you know, going into an Azure portal and uploading CSV files and copying and pasting GUIDs is not really a user-friendly way of doing it. So it's not something that you can really delegate down to the business around that. So that's really where our uh, product comes in. So if we come to the last scenario I want to talk about is our Extranet User Manager product. So it does federation with Office 365, just like ADFS, but it provides a, a fully branded, customizable experience. So here we have one of our clients, Kinross login page. You can see we've got a very unique, um, tailored login experience as part of that. And we're keeping the credentials for those users either in Active Directory or SQL under the hood there. We can do single sign-on to multiple systems. It doesn't have to be just SharePoint. I mentioned Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society, where we're logging into Desire to Learn as well through that. So we can provide nice experience, not, in, not just into Office 365. So there's really two sides to the product. There's a, an admin console and an end user piece. So the admin console allows you to, to add and edit users and groups. So the things that I was doing through the Azure portal, much easier to do. You can delegate that down and there's different roles and security rights you can apply as part of that through the product itself. And then for the end user, the login form is very customizable. We can do things like self-registrations and approvals, forgotten password reset, all as part of that experience as well. So let's actually go through that process. What I'm going to do now, apologies for all the browser sessions, see if I've got the right one here. Yes. So I am in yet another SharePoint tenant. I have a lot going on here. Uh, this one's called eumdemo.sharepoint.com. You can visit that URL yourself. Uh, you'll come up to our login form. So if I take that URL, I'm already logged in right now. I want to do an unprivate window and come in as a brand new user. still thinks I'm logged in. Let me just try that one more time. 
sometimes it's hard to clear out when you're using all these different identities to make sure that you clear your session out. Sorry. There we go. Took a minute. So what it's done is rather than bringing up the, the standard Microsoft login form, there's actually a feature you can now self-service through the admin portal to set your home realm discovery page in Office 65. And what that means is when you hit SharePoint Online and you're not authenticated, where does it redirect you to? And in our case, it redirects us to our Extranet User Manager page, which is actually hosted up in Azure in the Microsoft Cloud as well. And we've got full control over this login form. I showed you the, the Kinross one previously. We can customize and brand that however we want. One of the nice things that we can do is provide a registration process as part of that. So if I don't have an account on the site yet, I can click on the register here link and actually create my account. So I can go through and say, I'm Peter Carson 9. I've got lots of accounts on this one. So at a minimum, we need name and email address. The rest of the fields are up to you. We, we add fields, we remove fields, we can integrate them in with backend systems. There's lots of um, complexity we can add to the registration form if need be, as well as the rules around how the approval for this user is gonna happen. So when I click on register here, it's going to create a record in our database that there's a pending approval account, uh, but it doesn't actually create an account that you can log in with just yet because somebody needs to sign off and say, yeah, that's a valid user coming in. So there's a couple of emails that are going to be generated. One is going to be to me as the person that just registered saying, hey, thanks for registering. You're going to need a second email once you've been approved before you can actually sign in. And then there's going to be another one to me as a, um, an approver in the business um, just saying, hey, there's a new account here for you to approve. <coughs> so let's open the first one up. This is to me as the person registering, saying thanks for requesting an account. Uh, you need to wait for your second email before you can actually sign in. So that one's just information. This one here is to me as the approver saying, hey, Peter Carson 9 just signed up with this email address on our account. You need to edit their record and set their status to active. Let me copy that hyperlink. Again, I gotta make sure I put it into the right browser session. So that one's this one here. Let me just make sure I'm properly logged in. Normally you don't have these many login forms, it's just I'm wearing a lot of different hats through the session here. So I'm logged into our admin console here now. If I paste that link in, Here's the uh, edit user page for that particular Peter Carson 9 user that I just registered with. So I can see all the information they entered on the register page. I can see that they're currently pending approval, so they don't have any access. So I'm going to switch them to active. I'm going to put them in the SharePoint group so they have access to the SharePoint site. And I'm going to go ahead and save those settings. So at this point now, we're creating an account. It's actually in a SQL database in Azure, and we're sending out the second email, the welcome email, to the, the person that registered to bring them in. So we want to be able to onboard them easily. What we do is we send the, um, the email out with a time expiring token in there for them to click a link to set their password. So we'll just wait for that to come through. And then I'll be able to log in as that user. So from a password control point of view, it's important to us we never send passwords in plain text. Uh, we never allow administrators or business owners to see the partner's passwords. Only the partners themselves have access to that. Even if they forget their password, there's a forgotten password process where they enter in their email address. It sends them a password reset email and allows them to, to reset their password. So I can see here I've got until this time tomorrow to set my password. Let me just copy that link. And let's see, we'll bring it back to this one here and paste that in. So whatever password rules you have in terms of length, complexity, things like that, will then pass through as part of this form here. And there we go, I've changed my password. Now if I try and use that link again, let me just uh, repost that page. It says, sorry, that token's already been used or it's expired. You need to go through the link here to, to reset your password. So I can simply enter in my email address 
and I'll get a forgotten password, reset email, very similar process. It has a different time expiry on that that we can define. So all these emails that come through, they're all configurable through uh, the web console here. So I can come in and say, well, I want to change what the welcome email looks like. I can define how long that token is valid for, what the body of the, the email is. And you can see we've got placeholders here to do mail merges and things like that through there. So that, yep. It's flashing right now, or when I change. Oh, that's annoying. Um, let me see if I can get all of the windows onto my other, I'm using two monitors here. So let me just close out everything on this one monitor and bring in just the one that I wanna be working with. We'll see if that helps. Just a few windows open, apologies. Okay, so I wanna be, where? I wanna be back on this page here. So I've set my password. So is that still flashing now, Dinesh? And it's solid on that page? Okay, good, that's what I wanna see. Okay, so I've created my account for pcarson9. I set my password, but I haven't actually logged in yet. So let me just go ahead and log in under that user. And I use the password that I just set on that password set page. Now we have the option of having a disclaimer page. Uh, it's just Laura Mipsum in there right now. You'd obviously put in your own disclaimer as part of that, that they need to accept. You don't have to have that on. You can turn it off if you don't want it, but it does record that disclaimer into audit tables in the database. And in fact, the, um, the system audits all of the changes that are happening. So as people get invited, as they uh, change their password, as any of their profile information is updated, all that's audited in the database and available from that point of view. So I can come into a couple different things through here. I can go into my settings. I, I can update my own profile information. We've locked it down so you can't change your email address. We could allow that technically, but most clients don't want that. They don't want people to, you know, if somebody leaves the organization to, to switch their account to their personal Gmail account or something like that. Um, and I can also do a change password through here as well. Now, now that I've logged in, I can actually come to the... Um, the SharePoint site that we were originally trying to get access to. And, sorry, why didn't that, I've got way too many windows going here now, I'm getting confused, sorry. Let me try this one. Oh, sorry, I'm going to the wrong site, that's why. <laughs> I'm supposed to be going to eumdemo.sharepoint.com. I may have lost my login there when I close those windows. We'll see what happens. No, nope, it uh, remembered because I still had one of the browser windows open. Okay, so now it's you can see it's logged me in as Peter Carson 9 into the eumdemo.sharepoint.com site. So I've, I've provided that access in. In fact, we've got links into things like the change my settings and change password that I showed you previously um, off of the UM pages as well. So let's just take a, a quick scan back to the, um, the actual admin console side of that. So that's this window here. Let me pull this one out. I just want to give you a quick tour around uh, the, the admin side of the Externet User Manager product. So we saw the approval of a user account. We saw quickly how we could change the email templates in there. Um, you don't have to do a self-registration though. You could simply come in here and directly add a user right through this console. So if you want to do an invite only and not have self-registration, you can invite your people in uh, one at a time through here, put them in whichever groups are appropriate. And the idea is that you assign permissions in SharePoint Online to these groups from there. So you're not actually managing permissions once you've set the groups up from a SharePoint point of view. Now, if you've got a bulk set of users that you wanna load, maybe you've got 100 partners that you wanna onboard into the system, <coughs> excuse me, there is the ability to import users as well. 
So you can pull down an Excel template, fill it in with all the people that you want to set up accounts for, um, go ahead and import that. It'll take you through a validation step where it confirms that each of those records are valid. Once you confirm on that, it'll create all the accounts and it'll send all the welcome emails out to those users. Uh, we can see there's also the ability to, to manage groups as well. So we saw there was a EOM SharePoint group. We can see there's 10 people in that group. So if I click on it and open it up, you can see, well, there's my Peter Carson 9 account. I could remove that user from the group if I wanted to through here. I can also assign owners to a group. So if I want to delegate management of this group to somebody in my organization, maybe a, a particular business unit that wants to manage their own part of the extranet, I make them an owner. They have the ability to add and remove users from their group and add net new users to the system as a whole. So they wouldn't have all rights when they came into the home page here. They wouldn't see all the configuration or group management. They would simply see the search and add user options through here. I can also make somebody a group editor, which means they have the ability to, to do that, but also to, to add and edit groups itself, but not reconfigure the system. So there's different roles that people can play as they come in through here. When I do searches through, I can see all the users that I've set up through there. I can deactivate them. When they're deactivated, we, we remove the underlying security account so they don't have any ability to sign in to SharePoint Online anymore. We'd actually still keep a record of them in our database. So again, from an audit point of view, we know when that user came into the system. We also know who deactivated them and when. So we've got a full audit trail from that point of view. So very good from a delegation perspective. So let me just come back to my PowerPoint deck here now. So we've, we've gone through most of the features. They're here in the deck if you want to explore them uh, afterwards on your own from there, but I'll just quickly go, go through um, some of the main points there. So we, we talked about the single sign-on, the self-registration. This is another example for Public Health Ontario, um, a site that you can visit to, to see what that registration project looks like. The forgotten password where you send enter your email, sends you a password reset email. Um, works with SharePoint 2010, 2013, obviously Office 65 is our topic here. It's pretty straightforward to set up with Office 65. What happens when you install our product? You can install it on-premises, or as I mentioned, we can host it for you. Um, that installation process creates a PowerShell script and a certificate. Basically, you run that PowerShell either against your on-premise SharePoint if you're going that way, or against your Office 365, and it basically adds Extranet User Manager as an identity provider for your tenant and you can then log in through that process. It's fully adaptive, so if you're running on smartphones, tablets, we use Bootstrap from a, uh, a CSS framework point of view to make all the pages um, fully adaptive. The, the idea of delegation I talked about where you can make people group owners and IT doesn't need to manage the whole process, you can delegate that not only within your organization, you can even delegate external to your organization if that makes sense. In some scenarios that does. Hosted in Azure or on-premise, uh, fully multilingual. We're a Canadian organization, so bilingual English-French is very important to us. We have clients like Kinross that have translated in a half a dozen different languages. Uh, so it's quite easy. We have resource files that make it simple to, to manage that translation and updating of text. From a pricing point of view, uh, we have two flavors, the on-premise and the hosted. So the on-premise, you purchase a, a perpetual license for either eight or 13,000, depending on whether you have a single um, site that you're going to be authenticating into or whether you have multiple systems like say SharePoint and Desire to Learn would qualify as an enterprise. And then there's an annual software assurance of 20% on top of that. That provides you all updates as we, we put out new releases several times a year. And it also provides you with dev and QA farm licenses. So if you want to run a, a dev environment as well as your production environment, you don't need to purchase another license for that. You simply uh, keep your, your software assurance up to date and you're fine from that perspective. <clears throat> In the hosted environment, there's no software assurance. Everything's rolled into the, the product itself. So we do the product updates for you as part of that. Again, there's a standard in our enterprise at either 850 or 1070 a month for that. That includes all hosting facilities, so so we absorb the uh, the Azure costs as part of that. We have a partner firm that does 724 uh, network operations, so they monitor and remediate so that you've got somebody watching the site at all times and providing um, access from there. Full details are up on our site in terms of uh, options from there. A couple of uh, number of different clients across different spectrums that currently use the product. I mentioned we do a lot of work in the not-for-profit and government space, also in the, the for-profit um, 
you know, real estate, manufacturing, financial aviation. So lots of different clients across a broad spectrum of industries. So I've already taken you through the uh, the demo side to it. As I mentioned, you can visit that umdemo.sharepoint.com URL. You'll see the login, the registration process. Give it a try. I mean, we'll get the approval emails if you if you register. There's nothing confidential inside that site, so we can actually take you through that whole process. I've included links into a number of different sites here, so you can see, you know, these are clients that are live that have uh, public-facing extranets that uh, we're happy to share with you, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. And just in summary, kind of recapping over the uh, the different scenarios that we went through. So there's the external sharing in Office 65. I'm not a big fan of that from a governance point of view. There's a lot of challenges there. Um, just keeping it organized and, and well-structured is difficult. Uh, the Azure B2B stuff does look promising. I'm quite interested to see where things are going there. I mean, the logging into an Azure portal and uploading a CSV file with GUIDs is not a great user experience. And actually, I've been putting pressure on Microsoft to let us help with that. I mean, if they expose uh, the Graph API to let us manage the invitations into Azure B2B and then leverage it from there, I think that would be a nice win to win. And, and we could certainly build that as part of the Extranet User Manager product. So you'd use the same self-registration and user pages that I showed you in our product and have that actually write to Azure B2B, get all the benefits of you know, a single sign-on uh, across tenants and things like that, and not requiring subscriptions for those external users, which we do require if you're using the Extranet User Manager. So as you invite in folks through the UM product, you do need to ensure that you've got appropriate subscriptions in place for those users from a licensing point of view, because you're not, even though they're external users, because you're not going through the Microsoft method, uh, their service agreement doesn't cover that from that point of view. So things like the SharePoint kiosk plan pricing make a lot of sense there. I mean, if you've got a couple hundred users times a couple dollars a month, I mean, that's still pretty compelling from a cost point of view. It makes a lot of sense versus spinning up your own farm to do an extranet. But we have clients that have thousands or tens of thousands of users. The, the economics start to break down at that point of view. And we, we strongly recommend going to an on-premise SharePoint 2013 or 2016 for those kinds of scenarios. But, you know, if we can build on top of Azure B2B and flesh that out uh, so that we've got the user experience and the governance that we're looking for there, I think that could be a very cool solution as well. So again, you know, if you're interested in that, let us know, you know, we'll let Microsoft know the more of us kind of applying pressure from that point of view, the more likely we're to, to see changes there. I mean, it is part of their roadmap to allow us to do that. The question is when that's going to show up from that point of view. In terms of next steps from here, if you'd like to, to get a trial going, do a deeper technical demo with our team, uh, Manda's the, uh, the lady to reach out to. She can arrange that for you, uh, provide product information, provide costing, not just from a license point of view, but from an implementation point of view. You know, We can do the branding work, the registration customizations, and that's really a bespoke. Uh, we can talk about your requirements and understand what the budgets would look like from that point of view. In terms of upcoming events, we do have a, uh, a session on the books for February 24th to talk about extranets in SharePoint 2016. So 2016 just got announced as a release candidate. There was uh, public betas out, but the RC is now out as of yesterday. Um, we've already tested our product on uh, the previous public betas. No issues there. The, um, the authentication between SharePoint 2010, 2013, 2016 has remained pretty much the same. So it's nice. We can have a single code base across all of those as well as Office 65. It's the exact same product across all those. Uh, Dinesh and, uh, and Amanda, I'm assuming you've been answering questions that have been going through. We're pretty much out of time here. Dinesh, I don't know if there's any specific ones that you want me to, to deal with right now while we're on the line, or we could follow up afterwards from there. Awesome. Well, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. And uh, by all means, reach out and uh, we can set up a, a trial version for you or a private demo if you want to go deeper on your particular scenario. Thanks very much and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.